don't we wear the video tonight? Yeah, can we please? On the big night? Yeah, come on, Mom. It's okay. Sure. Come on. Let's throw caution to the wind. Put a little weekend in your week. Rent a video. Welcome to Vericon Video, a sometimes weekly show where we relive forgotten and unforgettable movies that once lined the shelves of video stores everywhere. I'm Brandon. And I'm Joseph. And today we're trekking to Springwood, Ohio to cruise down Elm Street and check ourselves into Weston Hills Psychiatric Hospital. We've been having bad dreams about this guy who's burned, wears a red and green striped sweater and has knives for fingers. Join us for group therapy, only straight talk here, and help us take down the murderous slasher of our dreams, Freddy Krueger, the bastard son of a hundred maniacs. We're talking to Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors from 1987, so dust off that dock and cassette, sit back, relax, and welcome to prime time, bitch. Welcome to the Cafe 80s, where it's always morning in America, even in the afternoon and noon. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. I have the only gun on board. Welcome to Con Air. Welcome. To Jurassic Park. Okay, uh, good evening, uh, America, and welcome aboard Apollo 13. I'm so glad you could come. This is going to be such an exciting day. I hope you're enjoying it. I think you will. Teenager Kristen Parker is carted off to a mental institution after apparently attempting suicide and learns that the other young people in the hospital's care are also haunted by a murderer that stalks them in their dreams. They join forces and cultivate their dream powers with the help of Freddy's former foe, Nancy Thompson, and together must defeat him in their dreams or else they won't wake up at all. So Joseph, are you, are you a dreamer? Do you have nightmares often? Yeah, I, uh, it's been reoccurring. I mean, more so as a middle schooler, elementary schooler, like a, you know, it's a little kid progression. Then you start maturing a little bit and, and start going away from adventures to, oh my gosh, I just failed my biology exam. Uh So, you know, but, but when I was little, I always, I always had this fear and it's, it's weird because it's, you know how you can sometimes hear your heartbeat through like your ears yeah you laid down yeah. on a put yeah so i had imagined those beats as like footsteps so like i'd imagine like this this group of boogeymen in my dreams going like thomping as that heartbeat and yeah. like one day they're just gonna come get me and and all this stuff and it was just like a progressive nightmare that just got worse and worse but i mean nothing happened from it thankfully like <laughs> Uh, Freddy Krueger here, but yeah, that was that was basically my nightmare in the childhood adventures. Jesus, that's terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> because it, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to get away from. Like you can't help it whenever you, right. your heart your heart rate is up and you just have that that pulsing or pounding in your ears. And yeah, I can right. see how that that would translate into the dream world as as footsteps. Footsteps. And, yeah. 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 How about you? Any crazies? My earliest dream that I can remember as a child was of Freddy Krueger. And I was talking to my mom about this last week. We were trying to figure out my introduction to Nightmare on Elm Street because my family didn't let me watch stuff like that. But my grandmother on my mom's side and my uncles would let me watch whatever I wanted. And so it's possible that I, I caught it, you know, when I was three or four or something like that, or just the wave of or the saturation of Freddie merchandise like around Halloween yeah, yeah. was my introduction or it could have been Freddie's nightmares the TV show which would have been a little more accessible uh, to me or I would have I would have caught it on TV so I don't really know when that started but I remember vividly dreaming uh, about Freddie and some of my other earliest dreams are of Alfred Pennyworth from the 1989 oh Batman <laughs> and th- this this shows you how I developed into the person I am. Like I'm dreaming about <laughs> stuff from movies, but also Pennywise from the original yeah. miniseries. It, I saw it on TV when it aired in 90, I guess it was. And I don't know who let me watch that, but I had nightmares about Pennywise for 10 years. Oh what, my gosh. What eventually kind of got me over that was I was on vacation with my family and I caught uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show on yeah. TV. <laughs> and so it kind of, I mean, I, I knew Tim Curry from Home Alone too, but seeing him in uh, in drag and singing I'm a Sweet Transvestite, it, it kind of lessened the, the Pennywise impact. <laughs> I do have these recurring dreams about like being in a, I don't know, a big open space where there are multiple tornadoes around me. Oh my. And I'm trying to get away from them. Or the one that happens the most often, I'd say at least once a month, is about 
tidal wave or a tsunami and being like standing on a beach and seeing like this, you know, mountain of, of water rising and being like in its shadow. It's, it's about to come down on me. Yeah. Coming towards you. Yeah. Oh, wow. Or my teeth falling out. I dream about that quite often. And I didn't, <laughs> I thought I was just weird, but apparently that's one of the most common recurring nightmares people have. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, it's really strange. That's interesting. It's, it's intriguing how the mind works like that. Just uh, like if you were to name one particular character that you're most scared of or that you were most scared of when you were little, was it Freddy? Oh, hands or, down, it would be Pennywise. Pennywise, hands yeah. down? Okay, okay. Be, and in part because he was a shapeshifter. I mean, Freddy's a shapeshifter too, but Pennywise could look like, I would yeah. often have dreams about, I don't know, being with my grandmother and hugging her or something. And then she starts oh. talking in, in the Pennywise, like Pennywise voice. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh. Like, It's giving me the willies thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> just that feeling of, yeah. of dread or right. I remember another dream I had maybe when I was in fourth grade where I was visiting my dad and I walked into the house and he had this recliner in front of the TV and when it spun around it was Pennywise sitting in the chair oh my gosh that's oh okay oh that's ridiculous yeah. mine, mine was Scream the from oh. 1996 film oh yeah, really it there's there's a scene um I distinctly remember it's it's like one of the characters she walks into this dark room full of like scream costumes and you don't know which one it is like which one is scream and i always have that reoccurring scene in my mind walking into a dark room full of that same mask repeating over and over again then all of a sudden you just get this knife in your chest you know it's just like (laughs) yeah it's weird it's it's interesting how the mind works it really is yeah okay so i performed in theater all the time in high school and as a theater group, we were very big nerds in horror films. And the first time I was introduced to Freddy was ironically when we were watching a Michael Myers film and everybody was like, Freddy's so much better. You know, this is some crap. Why don't we watch some Freddy, even Jason, you know, and all this, I'm like, who's Freddy? And so here we go. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And I watched the, first one and second one i i did not see dream warriors and so it just happened to be that right now here here it is dream warriors <laughs> that i get introduced to it thanks thank you theater <laughs> <laughs> i let's see i was freddy for halloween trick-or-treating at age four i had the sweater i had the hat i had this rubber mask <laughs> My mom, we were talking about this, like I said, last week, and she just said, I, I just can't believe that of all the things that you wanted to go as for Halloween, it was Freddy Krueger for this horror movie. <laughs> Around this time, too, I remember seeing, of course, the the covers for all the movies at the video store, but I remember one, one in particular, this video store, and this was around... Uh, I think the time that part five came out, it was around around 89 or so. I remember seeing seeing all the posters on the video store walls. And so they had one for When I'm Realm Street part five, Child's Play 2, Gorillas in the Mist, which was oh, a yeah. Sigourney Weaver movie. The Phantom of the Opera, yes. also starring Robert England. I remember seeing this cardboard stand up from Ghostbusters. My parents bought that for me and I, and I don't know what happened to it, but it's very collectible. Now, if you watch... Any of the Cinemasker stuff. So James Rolf, the uh, angry video game nerd, he's got one in his basement video store that you'll see on his uh, YouTube videos. He also does a really great review of the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street video game for Nintendo. When I was about 12 or so, my grandpa and I built this glove from copper and kitchen knives and an old leather glove. And it looked really, really good. But I remember we went to this little machine shop in town so that I could get a a sheet of copper that we can make the glove from. And this old guy that ran the place was like, what are you going to use it for? And I explained, we're going to build Freddy's glove from a nightmare on Elm street. And the guy just blinked and it didn't register. He had no idea what I was talking about. (laughs) I was like, you know, Freddy Krueger, nothing, nothing. Nothing at all. No, he was just here. Just take it. (laughs) Just take it. (laughs) You little nerd. (laughs) Yeah. And we went to this discount store and got some, these old kitchen knives and we, we soldered them to the, to the fingers and stuff. There's a photo of it. I'll put it on Twitter. It's my profile picture actually. Now there's, a, I remember there's this, this neighborhood kid that I played with and he thought that glove was so awesome, but his parents at some point didn't want him to come around anymore because they, they felt it was too weird for me to have this glove. <laughs> so I'd be running around in the front yard with this glove like an idiot. <laughs> 
it goes. So, like, what do you what do you think about that? Like, what, what, this kind of like kids being interested in in horror or kind of participating in those kind of pop I'm, culture moments. Yeah, I'm very big in imagination. Um, pop culture really brings out the best in creativity for kids. I mean, personally, for me, I was. I love Star Wars to the T and I, at every chance I got, I tried to, I dressed up as Darth Vader, Stormtroopers. And you know, even when my dad dressed up as a clone trooper, I was in second grade. I'll never forget it because he comes walking in with a big, huge a clone trooper outfit. And I was like, my dad's a clone trooper. Oh my goodness. You know, and asking all these questions, are you from Camino? (laughs) You know, and all this stuff. And, but, but just, it fills the mind, you know, and with these horror films, like such as Freddy Krueger, like, oh my gosh, it's, it's iconic because it not only represents dreams or nightmares, but it represents the art of just letting go, being yourself, being Freddy for one night on a night that represents such fantasy, such excitement. I think pop culture horror films, especially the one we're talking about today, it's it's a it's a beautiful thing because of how much joy it gives kids. Right. You know, and yeah, I mean it's, it's quite nice. horror movies create that sense of dread or fear, but it's temporary or it or it kind of recedes in the background. It might linger with you for a while, but it to me it's no different than going through a haunted house or right. riding a roller coaster or something like that. It's entertainment. Temporary thrill yeah. yeah so let's give you a little context a little background on a nightmare on elm street three dream warriors it's from 1987 it's a fantasy slasher film directed by chuck russell who would later go on to direct the mask the story was developed by wes craven and bruce wagner and the script was written in part with frank darabont who you might remember us talking about in our shawshank episode it stars heather langenkamp returning from part one patricia arquette larry fishburne priscilla pointer who we encountered last week in a Twilight Zone, the movie, Craig Wasson and Robert England as Freddy Krueger. Just to contextualize part three, let's break down the franchise a little bit for you. So the first Nightmare on Elm Street came out in 1984, directed by Wes Craven. And then it was followed by uh, part two, which was Freddy's Revenge, directed by Jack Shoulder, who is a film professor now at Western Carolina University. (laughs) We are at East Carolina University, Joseph and I. He got his start uh, editing trailers for New Line and was good friends with Bob Shea, who ran the company at the time. And he was actually the one that was responsible for naming the town Springwood. And his production company is called Springwood Productions. This was the, quote, gay nightmare starring Mark Patton in the the final girl role. And there has been talk for some time about a documentary called Scream Queen, where where he talks about, I guess, his experience working on uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 2. Then there's, of course, part three that we're talking about today, directed by Chuck Russell. Part four was Dream Master, directed by Rennie Harlan, who directed Die Hard 2, Deep Blue Sea. Part five was directed by Stephen Hopkins, who would later go on to direct Predator 2, Blown Away, The Ghost in the Darkness, and the 1998 Lost in Space. Then we get Freddy's Dead, the final nightmare. The climax of the film was presented in 3D. It was directed by Rachel Talalay, who had been involved in, I think, all of the Elm Street movies. To my knowledge, beginning with the first one, she was the assistant production manager and then moved on up the ranks to line producer and eventually director. And then we kind of depart from the traditional format of the Elm Street movies. We get Wes Craven's New Nightmare, which was directed by, of course, Wes Craven. And it's this self-referential meta cinema thing. It's it's, it's a good pre- it's a precursor to Scream. So it's, since you you brought up Scream earlier, I, I was thinking what a great pairing that made like with mm-hmm. Kevin Williamson and Wes Craven. As Scream and New Nightmare are both self-referential, and of course, as I think we said in a previous episode, that Kevin Williamson was an, an alum of uh, ECU, graduated. Uh, actually, around the time that uh, this movie came out, that part three came out. And then we get Freddy vs. Jason, directed by Ronnie Yu, who is known for directing Bride of Chucky and Warriors of Virtue. And yes, Colin, that movie is on the list if you're listening. So you'll be seeing that at some point in the future. <laughs> and this turd comes on, oh, on no. the scene. A Nightmare oh. on Elm Street, <laughs> the remake from 2010, directed by Samuel <sighs> Bayer, a music video director. And I hate this movie uh. so much. <laughs> Sometimes you just have that one film where you're like, hey, where's the trash can at? Anybody know? <laughs> yeah, it's one of those, like, if I was gifted it, yeah, I know exactly where I'm going to put this and just throw it in the trash. Yeah. Why? That's my question is why. 
Oh. Now, I, I don't like the writing. I don't like the direction. I don't like Jackie Earl Haley's interpretation of the character. And he's an Oscar-nominated actor. He's brilliant, but he's really just playing Warshak again from Watchmen. He's really annoying in, in this... Mm, this dress was always one of my favorites. You know, he's just <laughs> so annoying. Right. Right. It's uh, like it's like it gets on your nerves more than it scares you at all. It at, does. Like, at all. And the Freddy makeup, part of it was CG, part of it was uh, a prosthesis. He, he looked like a like a burned rabbit to me. <laughs> His eyes yeah. looked weird. And I don't know. I de- that's just one that I try to ignore it ever happened. The voice sounds pretty good, I guess. I don't like that mm, stuff he does. It's some of the worst ADR I've ever seen. So like he, he could barely even move his face in that makeup. So he had to re-record all of his lines and it just didn't you could tell it just he wasn't it wasn't in that moment. Oh, and I should mention that from 1988 to 1990, there was a TV show called Freddy's Nightmares, and some of the directors of that show include Mick Garris and Robert England himself and Toby Hooper, that I think directed the first two episodes that was Freddy's origin story. Brad Pitt was in an episode, if you can believe that. <laughs> but it's it's incredibly hard to find here in the US. There are several DVD bootlegs on eBay if you want to go check it out. They don't really hold up all that great. They just kind of went wild with it, but I I might pick that up, revisit that. I was thinking about I know that, you know, we're living in a time of the reboot, the remake, the reimagining, uh recycling old properties. If they were to remake this say this year or next year, what would be the ideal presentation of that, you think? Well, I mean, because CGI, uh, CGI has a lot to do with everything nowadays. It, you know, and you can easily see the effects that were made back then in the 80s and, and see exactly how they could come about. Um, I, especially for this film, you know, for example, the, uh, what was it, the little moving wounds oh the yeah girls the are, you know and, yeah re- or, uh, opening up and yeah. closing that kind little of thing mouse, or, or, yeah. right right <laughs> or the kids or the kids faces on freddy's chest oh yeah um, yeah the, that kind of thing the effects would definitely be as realistic as could ever be possible nowadays they did such a shit job in 2010 with this movie because they could have done so much better right they could have but but they didn't and and i feel like we're reaching 2020 unbelievably so with a new freddy film which i think could happen the ultimate freddy film not a sequel not a prequel people really want to see how graphic it can be for such a nightmare kind of character it just it just makes you want to have a remake I know. And, and I'm a little conflicted because part of me wants them to bring the Nightmare on Elm Street property back. But at the same time, I don't know if I really want it. I, I don't know if we need it. You know, just kind of leave it. Because of how much we've had so far. In, in yeah, the I think it's been, had a yeah. good run. It had a very, very good run. However, if they did bring it back, I would like to see a series. You think so? Okay. Uh, yeah. Shutter should do it and make it character driven. Just call it Elm Street. Get some new talent. Robert England, 71. I don't think it would be a good idea to bring him back, even though he is Freddy Krueger. He did appear as Freddy in an episode of the Goldbergs around Halloween last year. I didn't see it, but I don't think they would do a series. I think they would just do a film or a series of films and do what they did before. Remake the first one and it'll probably fail. Uh, so anyway, moving on. Music is by Angelo Badalamenti, who composed the music for Twin Peaks and Christmas Vacation, which we had done uh, last year. And as we mentioned in our Shawshank episode, this is the first writing credit for Oscar-nominated writer and director Frank Darabont. This was huge. The the music was great. Some great heavy synths in there. And it has a great soundtrack. And we got Dokken. They have a few songs in here. But uh, let's see. So since part two wasn't successful, New Line wasn't keen to continue on with the property. And Craven wasn't involved with the second one. He didn't really want or expect uh, sequels would even be a thing. Like there would be that much interest. He came on for part three with the intention of this being the last one. And number three is the third highest grossing of the franchise to date, Patricia Arquette. Her character comes back in part four, but I've heard that she got pregnant or wasn't offered enough money. There's a little debate about why she didn't come back. She was replaced by Tuesday Night, who sang Running From This Nightmare over the main titles in part four. I really like part four pretty well. The original premise of the film reportedly involved Freddy invading the real world and haunting the actors and crew responsible for the A Nightmare on Elm Street films. And this idea was rejected by the studio, though Wes Craven, of course, later reused it for New Nightmare. And it was brilliant, brilliantly conceived. And according to Craven, the idea for the mental health facility, treating the Dream Warriors was not just kind of a nod to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, but it was 
inspired by real life establishments. He said, quote, at that time, there was a kind of movement of such places that even advertised on television. Send us your troubled child and we'll make them OK. And essentially, they were like prisons or insane asylums, which is terrifying to me. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Jeez. parents just carting you off, you know. Oh, my gosh. And generally speaking, this is the fan favorite besides the first A Nightmare on the Street. And Robert England said in interviews that uh, number four, he thinks, is his best work as an actor in the series. But ultimately, New Nightmare is his favorite overall. One, for one week during filming, Robert England was working 24 hours every day. He was he was napping in his makeup chair. And by day, he was uh, also he was wrapping up filming on this uh, TV series called Downtown. And then he would report back uh, to set for Dream Warriors at night. And if you want that's, that's if, incredible. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a trooper, man. If you want to know more, like the Consequence Podcast Network has a podcast called Halloweenies. And last year they did an entire series on Halloween and Michael Myers. And this year they're doing uh Freddy Krueger and a Nightmare on Elm Street. So they just released their first episode on Valentine's Day. And go check that out. It's three hours long. It's rich. It's really excellent analysis and commentary. And also if you haven't seen it, Go watch the documentary Never Sleep Again, The Elm Street Legacy. It is, I think, four hours long. It's very extensive, great interviews. And I picked up the two-disc Blu-ray yesterday, and it has even more hours of bonus features. It's really excellent. They go visit the filming locations and, and uh, talk more about the fans, the Fred heads, as they're called. So go check that out. And, <sighs> Joseph, I'm getting kind of sleepy don't be sleepwalking hey, on me now. Let's, let's sleepwalk through this movie. Go see what we can find. All right, let's descend into the dream world. All right, so we open on the old New Line logo, which I think is really, really cool. I want this design on a T-shirt. It's got that flickering black and and red. It looks I great. Thought it was, I thought it was pretty red. Yeah, um, it's a great font. I mean, I love the New Line logo, period. It's just, it's probably one of my favorites. It's, in my mind, it's just so sedimented in the, the movie-going <laughs> experience of my youth. So we see these extreme close-ups. Someone is making this papier-mâché uh, house, and there's mi- uh, mixing plaster of Paris. And using like newspapers to build this little house. Kristen, she's listening to some docking into the fire. <laughs> <laughs> the fire. fire. <laughs> this, rem- I don't know, this reminded me of a, uh, a board game commercial from the 90s. The game was called Crossfire, and it was this, it had this like really oh amped up heavy metal yeah. theme. It's like Crossfire. You get caught up in the crossfire. And it, <laughs> it's 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 pretty crazy. That's that's good stuff yeah. right there. So we see it's Kristen. She's drinking her diet coke. We get that little not so subtle product placement. Mom, not, not mentioning a spoonful of Folgers. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> Where the hell does that come from? <laughs> that, that sounds disgusting. It's so bad. I'm like, if you just want to stay up, I mean, just don't do that. Maybe she didn't have access. If Nancy in the first one can go to the store and pick up some stay awake or whatever the crap it was called. She could have done that. Eating (laughs) eating Folgers is a bit much. Mm. So her mother bursts in. Mother's been out. It's like, oh, what are you doing up? It's time to go to bed. Oh, mom, I'm still having those awful dreams. And the mom's date calls from downstairs. Where do you where do you keep the bourbon? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a great payoff for that later. And so anyway, lights out. We look we're looking at this dilapidated house model. And of course, if we've seen the first two movies, we recognize it as, as Nancy's house or 1428 Elm Street. Before we continue, I I, I don't know. I, I, I asked people this on Twitter. I'm kind of confused about this because this house in the first movie is Nancy's house, the Thompson's house. And then in part two, it's uh, Jesse Walsh and, and his family's house. And he discovers Nancy's diary hidden. And that's how he learns that who Freddie is. And, and then in this one, it's Freddie's house. Right. Because one of the little girls later says, this is where he takes us. And right. and, so, and it's all dilapidated. And so this always really confused me. But I think one reason why I'm okay with it now is after talking to people is that we never see the 
real house. And this one, we just see it in the dream world. And so it could be just this representation or approximation of, of the house. So that, yeah, in the real world, it was Nancy's house. But then in the dream world, it's this is going to where Freddie takes people. So she thinks she wakes up. But it's a false awakening. These children are doing their chant. The one, two, Freddy's coming for you. They're doing They're jumping rope. And she's in front of the house. And there's this little girl on a tricycle. And it's like, what's your name? My name's Kristen. What's yours? <laughs> it just skittles. <laughs> doesn't answer. It just doesn't even answer with a name. I was so, Brandon, I was waiting for a name. I was waiting so bad for her. I was like, please just tell her her name. But she just fucking giggles. She giggles. I don't it's know it's so it. unexpected because like you said, yeah, you're expecting the name. And then just the little giggle is, is so unsettling because you're not so expecting it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and okay. Kristen asks, what is this place? And she's just like, I got to go now. Where do you have to go? Yeah. You go into this creepy house on a little tricycle. Tricycles are creepy anyway. They are. Yeah. So Kristen goes after her. And descends into the basement, and we can hear the little bell on the on the tricycle. Ring, 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 ring. And the, the girl's down there. I guess she carried the tricycle down <laughs> to the basement, this little girl. And she tells Kristen, this is where he takes us. And then there's this, uh, like, a little furnace. It bursts into flames. There's skulls in it. She says, Freddy's home. And Kristen grabs the girl and takes off running with her. And as she's running down the hallway, she gets stuck in this, like, muck. Like, the floor kind of becomes sticky, and she can't get traction. And Freddy's right behind her. He's coming in. It's a near miss. She runs. She stops into this room, and there's this big room full of hanging corpses. The little girl says, put me down. You're hurting me. And Kristen looks down and it's this little skeleton with matted hair. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's so scary. <laughs> it is. It is. In the Never Sleep Again documentary, we see the special effects creator, Mark Shostrom, that he was asked to build this little girl corpse that Kristen would discover uh, that she was holding. And Chuck Russell told him, think Auschwitz. And so there, you can see pictures of this. It's a wow. really scary effect, but it was decided... That's too grotesque. That's taking it too far. And then they just quickly threw together this little skeleton. So I think wow. he's a little bitter about that because he worked pretty hard on it. And I think that this movie is interesting because we don't get a resurrection scene at the beginning. So we get them in, in part four and part five where Freddy, you know, he comes back. We see him coming back. And my favorite is four when this dog is just out in this junkyard and pisses fire and the ground opens up and Freddy kind of re regenerates. It's really great. Uh, but uh, yeah, in this one, Freddie's just back. I'm I'm fine with that. I don't I don't need. I mean, hey, yeah, he's yeah. just he just he's just back. We don't need an explanation. And this next scene really used to scare the crap out of me when Kristen's in the bathroom and she sees Freddie in the mirror and the handles on the or the knobs on the on the sink like one grabs her hand and the other becomes like Freddie's claw and the blades are popping out and so that that slashes her. Her wrists and and mom bursts in, discovers her, and she's bleeding out. And of course, she tried to kill herself. And so we got to send you away. Yep. Off to the psych ward. <laughs> mm hmm. So now we're at Weston Hills. We meet Larry Fishburne, good old Lawrence Fishburne, Morpheus himself. And uh, he plays Max. He's one of the, I guess, orderlies there. We meet the uh, doctor, Neil Gordon, who this actor looks a lot like Bill Maher. <laughs> 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 and they're talking about like theories about suicides and we, we're meeting the dream warriors as they move through the hallways. So we meet Taryn and Jennifer Gordon's asking her about her self mutilation issue with burning herself with cigarettes. We meet Philip and then Kincaid and he's in the, the quiet room, this padded room. And then we meet kind of the head of the, of the war, Dr. Sims, Priscilla Pointer. But there's a, there's this talk about this, some hot shot coming in, some someone who's an expert in dream pattern research coming in and kind of stirring things up. We'll later find out that that is Heather Langenkamp's character, Nancy, returning from part one. So Kristen's brought in and she won't be sedated. She's fighting everybody off. She grabs a scalpel and then she starts chanting, doing that, uh, you know, one, two, phrase. One, two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, phrase Three, coming for four, you. Four, better lock your door. door. <laughs> <laughs> and then Nancy pops in and finishes it to never sleep again and wants to know where she learned that rhyme and she doesn't answer but they disarm her i really don't like it in movies when people have an open opportunity to say hey this is what's going on and they don't like they don't even they don't yeah and this movie's all about people not believing you so you've got people not only parents but people in authority who determine that you are crazy yeah you're you're crazy or there's some kind of mental disorder we even need, we need to get to the root of the problem. We have 
hundreds of years of, of psychiatric research and we know what we're talking about. We've been to school for a decade and we know better than you. I, I think I, I really loved Nancy's, Nancy's character in this movie, though. I did, too. She, she just connects so beautifully with all the rest of the children. But I think we needed some type of clarification that somebody actually understands these kids versus these crappy adults who don't know shit, even though they've been <laughs> reading books in all their life, you know? Right. Uh, she, yeah. for one, like she, she relates to them because I mean, she doesn't know yet that Freddie is kind of the link between them, but, but she recognizes that, that these are like because of her experience with her mother and her father not listening to her at all. Right. Like she she understands where like the position these kids are in and becomes that ear, becomes that confidant, becomes that that compassionate type that they need. So Nancy meets with Dr. Gordon and they're talking and she's trying to learn a little bit more about the kids. And Gordon says that they're, they're survivors when they uh, they have sleep disorders. They have this group delusion. That I think later Philip says. We were dreaming about the same thing before we even got here. And so yeah. <laughs> how, how is this not perplexing to you doctors out there? And they're just immediately dismissed. Uh, Nancy spills her purse out and Dr. Gordon's helping her put all the stuff back. And she he finds this pill bottle with a prescription drug called Hypnosil for sleep disorders. And it it's kind of a red flag in his mind. Like, oh, there's something... About her, that's a right. bit off. Maybe Gordon sees this creepy nun, and then it disappears. Max is explaining uh, how group therapy works, and Philip, he's the the walker, the sleepwalker. He looks like Sean Astin. Yeah, he does. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first thought. Yeah. And he's he talks about building these marionette puppets, but he he's very limited in the materials that he can use because they won't let him have a knife, and afraid he's going to kill himself. Uh, we meet Kincaid, and then. Uh, the, the the consensus is that these are good kids, but they're dangerous. Danger not only to others, but them, especially themselves. Right. We meet Joey, and he's spying on this hot nurse. <laughs> he's got his eye on th- the, throughout this whole movie. And and this is in the script, too. But when he, he's introduced in the script, it says that he has a tear tattooed under one eye. In this shot, he has the tear under his eye, and we never see it again. Never. Yeah. I, I don't I don't understand what that's all about. <laughs> I got nothing. I'm, I'm perplexed. I've, I've never heard anybody talk about it, so we'll just move along. <laughs> Jeez. Nancy interviews Kristen's mother at her house. The mother's not taking it too seriously. Says, I can't offer you any insight, and, and I've got to go. <laughs> I'm a busy woman. Just let me smoke my cigarettes and let me get out the door. Excuse me. So Nancy goes to Kristen's room. She wants to look through her things, and then she sees the house. And so we've got two bits of evidence now. So we've got this model house that she said she will tell Kristen that she used to live in, and we get the nursery rhyme. And so she's probably already thinking, yeah, Freddie's back. So Dr. Gordon, he decides to do some research on his computer, his really fancy state-of-the-art computer from 1987, and learns that hypnosil is for suppressing night terrors. And so he he's kind of checking. He's curious. He's checking up on her. But it's a, it's an experimental drug, right? And so that in itself opens I, a, it opens a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. Because you know? I, I think that he's curious because of course she's new to the the facility and the staff. But you know she has a very narrow specialization in dream pattern uh, research. And so I, I think that because she has dream disorders, that I don't know that I think that rouses his curiosity and it kind of keeps. Keeps that on the back burner of his mind. Now, Kristen's in bed. She's doodling the house. I don't know about how people work through different issues, but if, if I saw this house in my nightmares, I probably wouldn't be building a model or drawing pictures of it. I'd probably want to preoccupy myself with anything else. Right. Right. You know what's interesting about this part is that first thing that came to my mind was, okay, she's definitely got a problem, right? Because Freddie's not just in her mind, he's controlling her mind. And this is this is where, you know, if, if you have nothing else to do in your free time but draw that crap, <laughs> I mean, you know, there's 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 something that's triggering your neurons that's telling you that you can't get away from it. And I and I think the director did a very good job in signifying this little part of telling the audience that Kristen is like behind bars. She can't get out. Yeah, it's like she can't she's so entrenched in it, like she can't get away from it. So it's it it becomes the thing that occupies her mind at all times. Right. So she dozes off the door 
creaks open and this tricycle rolls in all by itself and leaving bloody tire tracks. And I saw this at Planet Hollywood in Nashville uh, when that was still around. And uh, that was really cool. I got a picture of it somewhere. I got to track that down. So the, the tricycle just starts to melt. And so she leaves and the door closes and then she's back at the Elm Street house. And as she's walking through the house, she sees this roasted pig on the table. And it barks at her. <laughs> <laughs> and this is not a puppet. This is a real pig. What? The, yeah, they picked this, this dead pig and they gutted it and turned it into a puppet. And the crew uh, that worked on the movie, they said they can still smell that pig to this day. It was rotten and foul. Oh, oh my gosh. What? <laughs> yeah, it barks Man. at her. That's, yeah, bar- <laughs> The lengths that people go through just to get this. I know. I mean, first first with uh, Shawshank, we talked about Morgan Freeman and like him, you know, throwing the baseball over and over and over and over and over again until they mm-hmm. got the scene right, you know? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we just talked about Freddy and, and how much uh, he had to go through in order to get that part right, uh, you know, 24-hour work days. And then this, killing a pig just so he can bark at a girl. Damn. <laughs> I mean, if it was probably cheaper <laughs> yeah, than, to, true. than to build the puppet. Oh, man. So she goes into this room and then the lights come on and then there's a thing that's moving under the rug, kind of like a like a shark underwater kind of thing or a, or like a gopher, I guess. So it's 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 moving under the, the carpet or under the rug and then it's knocking out parts of the walls. And so we don't know what what is going on. And then all of a sudden, the, this Freddy snake bursts out of the floor and starts gobbling her up and i love this effect because it's like she was being pulled out of the spready snake and then they played it back in reverse so it has this kind of unnatural quality this gobbling kind of effect and this original uh puppet (laughs) uh or animatronic came out looking too phallic (laughs) (laughs) it was pink and uh kevin yeager said in an interview like when he saw it he said it looks like a penis (laughs) and they were about they're about to shoot. Does. I know they were about to shoot this thing in an hour, and they, so they didn't have enough time to paint it. So they had to co- they covered it with this green goo to kind of tone down that pinkish hue. <laughs> so I, <don't> know. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I like I like that that kind of nasty has this really slimy texture to it. But like, yeah, if you look at the like the early models of this thing, and you're like, yeah, this is it looks like a dildo. <laughs> <laughs> this little maquette. And so she calls out and then Nancy, she's awake. She's reading uh, at home. And then she hears Kristen calling out, feels something's wrong. And then she just falls asleep. Like she just kind of collapses into this chair and falls through the chair into the dream world. And she, she stumbles upon Kristen fighting the Freddy snake, snags a piece of broken mirror and stabs it in the eye. And there's this great moment where you, it's this close up of the, the Freddy snake face. And it's, Look, it's eyeing Nancy. And it's just like you, you <laughs> like, like you're back. You're you back. Know? Yeah. They take off running and eventually they're able to wake up. And when Nancy wakes up, she's got a cut on her hand. And so we know it was, even though it was a dream, we're it's reminded, real. we're telling the audience that yes, if you get hurt in the dream, you get hurt in real life. So Nancy's talking to Kristen and she's gesturing to the model and says, I used to live in this house. I'm a little confused again about the timeline. Like Nancy was in high school in the first movie. And then part two is kind of its own uh, self-contained story that, that doesn't really connect to any of the others. So we don't, and she's not that much older. She's actually like three years older <laughs> than she was uh, in, in the first movie. So I, I don't, I don't know. So, yeah. but anyway, the, yeah. she's like, yeah, I used to live in this house. Nancy's questioning her about her ability to bring other people into their dreams. And Kristen says that, well, I ne- haven't done it in a long time, but I used to bring my dad in quite often. And she wants to know if the man in my dreams, Freddie is real. And yeah, he, he's, he's real. So here we are in group therapy and we meet Will played by Ira Hyden. This guy, I think he would be a great hang. Like he's just, he's really chill in the, in the interviews mm-hmm. and stuff. And he, he's such a, such a nerd. He's such a like uh, at the at the time uh, that he was he was cast. He was a, a Dungeons and Dragons dungeon master in high school, and he it made him feel secure in the role. And he thinks that's the reason he got the part because he was he was the oh, wizard master. Everything <laughs> connects. I have I have four friends. 
who are very much into this game. And uh, I'd be coming home like at 8, 9 p.m. at night uh, from my EMS class. And here they are in the living room, all playing Dungeons and Dragons. And you see them like, uh, step four, we're going down a yellow brick road, picking up hammers and axes and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> and, and, but, but I just think the, the imagination of, uh, of this kid will, you know, because we see later on in the film, like how epic it gets with him and how much it helps him get away from Freddy. Who's, right. He does, doesn't have much now because of his legs, you know, and he still feels high and mighty. Right. Yes, cause, yeah, because he is in a wheelchair. We don't really hear how he did it, but it said it was an accident that maybe he tried to kill himself by jumping off of something. I don't know. I didn't really catch that fully when I watched it last time. But but anyway, so Jennifer, the cigarette burn girl, she says, I want to be an actress and I want to be on TV. And everybody's like, whatever, <laughs> not going to happen. And we see Joey and his tattoo is gone. <laughs> And, Why? <laughs> and Philip, I think Philip is the most rational one in the group. Yeah, that, he, he just says, we've all dreamed about the same thing before we even met and no one cares. <laughs> Dr. Sims just ignores him. Doesn't care at all. Not, not at all. Not at all. So later on, they're, they're in their, in the room, Joey, Will and Taryn are playing D and D or in this case, it's called wizard master. <laughs> Max comes in, lights out. Nancy's having dinner with Neil Gordon and Nancy is trying to tell him, and I guess she waited till they had dinner to set to kind of burst the bubble that hey, there's this Freddy guy and people are in danger. Right. It's like I don't know if I suspected my neighbor is a serial killer, I I would probably go to the police. I wouldn't schedule a lunch or an interview <laughs> for next yeah. week. It might be important. There's just okay. no sense of urgency, I At guess, all. because Nancy is the expert. She is the dream expert, but she has had previous encounters with Freddy. So she, she knows these things. She knows the rules of the, of the dreamscape, but no one wants to listen to an intern, you know? Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and because she's uh, on medication herself for dreams, that also discredits her in some way. So she says these patients are in real physical danger and you should think about prescribing this drug called hypnosil, which, which suppresses dreams. And he's like, that's, that's too risky. It's too experimental. Right. I was like, I'm sorry, but no, and so the dream warriors are asleep. Uh, we come into Philip's room and we see his puppets hanging, his marionette puppets hanging up on the wall. And one of the blank faces morphs into Freddy's. It's a pretty cool uh, yeah. stop motion effect. His claws pop out, he cuts himself down from the strings. This is kind of a goofy effect, but he grows <laughs> to full size Freddy. I don't know. It doesn't look it's, all that great, but <laughs> I mean, you kind of expected it, I guess. Yeah. I was just like, <laughs> yeah, it just the way yeah. it looks, it's just, it's just his image. It looks, it looks kind of like you're zooming in on him and he's just getting yes. bigger. I don't know how to describe it, but uh, he slashes, well, he jerks the, uh, the sheet off of Philip and his arms and legs are exposed and he slashes Philip's uh, arms and legs and the tendons pull out and he becomes, he becomes marionetted <laughs> and, Freddie walks him out as a puppet out of the out of the room, and it's just it's really gory. It's really gnarly looking um, gore. I, I, I literally I, I I loved this I, and how yeah. realistic they got. They it's it was nice. It looks really really good, and there's this weird sound effect too. I, I listened to the soundtrack. It's not on the soundtrack, even though it's music. It's just this pulsing this kind of I don't know this really invasive sound. It was really, intense. Yeah, it, that really heightened it for me. He goes through the wall. Yeah. Yeah, or, uh, or was it? It was the door. Yeah, was it the door? yeah, yeah. I think it was the door. Yeah, he doesn't but, go. But th- still, like, like what? That didn't make sense. But anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll forgive it. We'll forgive it. And there's some terribly unobservant nurses here. There's always anybody that's ever a guard in a movie. They're always watching TV or reading a magazine or talking to a buddy. They're never doing their job. So this kid mm-hmm. who is on suicide watch just gets out of his room and just and walks out. And so Joey sees him and Joey can't talk later. He can, but he's, he's been traumatized to the, to the extent uh, he's, he's just unable to talk, but he's unable to, to call out for help. And so he does the lassie thing. <laughs> he, gets, <laughs> he sees Philip in the tower and he got, and, and Will's, Will is banging on the window. He breaks the window and he's screaming at Philip and Philip's like on the edge. Like he's about to sleepwalk off the building. And so Joey's causing commotion to alert people. He's banging on the nurse's desk and it, but it's the lassie thing. It's kind of like, what is it, boy? Arr, 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 arr. You know, and the dog can't tell him, but he's just like, follow me, follow me. Right. And so we see this giant Freddy over the, the tower. 
and he severs the strings and Philip falls to his death. And they rule it as a sleepwalking accident, which, okay, yeah, he's a sleepwalker. But Will says he was wide awake. I could tell. Well, it's, it was a suicide. It was a suicide. It wasn't an accident. It was a suicide. I and, just think the justification behind it. It's you don't. It's it's not credit. It's not as credible as you know. Sleepwalking is sleepwalking, but the, someone's not going to sleepwalk themselves all the way across the like you know, the, the, the property. Like, the property, the, right? Yeah. Like, up the stairs. Up the stairs. I, yeah. I don't understand how he got out. This, this is a, a, a psychiatric hospital. There's not right. locks on the freaking doors. And well, yeah, and he goes through a door. Yeah. <laughs> Was this okay. a magic door? Wow. A, <laughs> this one doesn't have a lock. It doesn't need one. You can just pass through it. It just looks like a solid <laughs> opaque wall. <laughs> and I think Taryn is just exclaiming, this was murder. This was not suicide. This was not an accident. And Sims and Gordon, they're not having it. Sims is like, we're going to do mandatory locks on the doors, evening sedation. And Kincaid's like, oh, hell no. <laughs> You're not going to put me to sleep. And so he's fighting them off. But Nancy comes to the rescue. She advocates for them. And Gordon, I don't think he completely understands what's going on, but he's going out on a limb and believes or wants to believe in Nancy and, and tells Sims, I want to try Hypnosil. Yes, it's right. experimental, but I want to give it a try. And He's definitely switching sides here, for sure. Right. And Sims won't allow it, but Gordon is insistent. So, okay, well, it's your responsibility if anything further happens. And Dr. Gordon actually feels kind of liberated. He's like, oh, I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> He stood up for himself and, and for the kids and for Nancy. Kincaid is in a quiet room. Jennifer's in this uh, like a little parlor, a little TV room. She says, I got to stay up. Max comes in and it's okay. You need to get to bed. And she's like, because of what happened with Philip, just please let me stay up tonight. He's like, okay, but I never saw you. And there's this scene with Taryn, this male nurse. Oh, this really creeped this, me out. He comes up. A, yeah. He's kind of like, hey, baby, I got the keys to the dispensary. Let's get high. And she's not having it. She's he's being all flirty and creepy. And if you uh, if you need a history lesson, I'll be your teacher. Yeah, <laughs> that dirt bag. My goodness, <laughs> like, I'll be your teacher. Like, what a prayer, if you know. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's talking pervy, to a little young girl. girl. Yeah, and she says something like, "I'll you know, I'll tell." You know, if you try something or, but he says, well, who's going to take the word of a junkie like you? So like, when it, what a piece of shit. <laughs> I know. And well, I love this scene. So Jennifer, she's watching TV. She's lighting up. She burns her hand with a cigarette uh, to stay awake. She's watching the Dick Cavett show. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> as a guest is Zsa Zsa Gabor. And what I love about this scene is that uh, Dick Cavett was allowed to pick the person he'd be interviewing in this scene. And he picked Zsa Zsa Gabor because he thought she was the dumbest person he'd ever met in his life. And he'd never, oh my he'd never have her on his show in real life. He said, so if there was one person he wanted to see killed by Freddie, it would be her. That's what, <laughs> Oh my gosh. I love Dick Cavett. I, I mean, his show was before my time, but I remember he had a, um, a small part in Beetlejuice as one of the Dietz's friends. I mean, he had a talk show for a long time. He knows everybody in the business that has ever done anything. <laughs> it's really impressive. There's a great interview with him I listened to recently uh, on Gilbert Gottfried's Super Colossal podcast. Go check that out. He's got some really fantastic stories. And so Dick Cavett on the screen, he he says, uh, can I just say something? Like interrupting Jaja. <laughs> Who gives a fuck what you think? And he becomes Freddy and is about to slash at her and it goes to static or this white noise. <laughs> and Jennifer gets up. She's approaching the TV and these mechanized hands, these arms burst out of the TV, grab her and pull her up. And on top of the TV, Freddy's head pops out. It's kind of comical, but he's got the little, little an antennas and stuff. And that's what he says. You know, this is it, Jennifer. Your big break in TV. <laughs> Welcome to prime time, bitch. And, <laughs> and smashes her head into the TV. Uh, can, can we take a, can we take a note here and just emphasize how brilliant of a line that is? Just oh, it is. Yeah. It's in my top to three. Time, it, it's my number one, but it's, it's yeah. Of the series, entire series is the number one line for me. Welcome <laughs> to prime time, bitch. It's, uh, it's and a I'm, line I'm forever going to live by. Yeah. And I, and I think that Robert England actually improvised that. So wow. like, that was his contribution. And I'm really baffled by how this gets ruled a suicide because she was mourning the death of Philip or whatever. 
I mean, if you look at the scene, the last shot of her with her head stuck in the TV and her feet dangling, she's like three feet off the floor. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. did (laughs) she just, she just leapt with all of her might and thrust her head into this TV hanging on the wall. Like, (laughs) I mean, I guess these kids might be superhuman, but that's just, yeah. Suicide, whatevs. Whatevs. All that education just gone through the roof. I know. All right, we're going to take a little break, but we'll be back right after this. Let's take a moment to give a special shout out to our patrons, Colin, James, and Annette. Thank you all so very, very much for your support. We love you, and thank you, Annette, especially for suggesting this episode. Really hope you enjoy it. If you're interested in becoming a patron and want to be a cool kid like Colin, James, and Annette, go to patreon.com slash video for more information. Our two tiers are $2 a month, and that gets you a shout out on the show and a name check in the show notes as long as you remain a patron. $4 a month gets you those perks plus a monthly bonus episode not available anywhere else in addition to other exclusive written audio and video content as we create it in the future we'll add new tiers of course as we grow but for now you can pledge two dollars a month or four dollars a month and get really cool shit from us so go check it out now back to the movie So we're at this funeral for Kristen and perhaps Philip. I can't can't even keep up with who's dying and who is <laughs> and who's funeral we're here's at. And there's, they go, yeah. In Springwood, Ohio, they go to a lot of funerals. It's a it's a weekly event. So this nun approaches Neil. He's watching from afar, and we learn that her name is Sister Mary Helena, and she does work at the hospital. We think, which is okay. This is spoiler alert. This is Freddie's mother. This is Amanda Kruger. And so she's dead. This is a ghost. Mm -hmm. But Neil's like, yeah, I recognize you. You do volunteer work at the hospital. This ghost Uh, is doing volunteer uh, work (laughs) at the hospital. (laughs) Um, But I, I but I think, I think what it is, is he, he miss uh, recognizes her, maybe mistakes her for somebody else or somebody. And he's like, oh yeah, you do volunteer work at the hospital. And she's just like, yeah, sure. Whatever you say, buddy. Right. She tells him that the unquiet spirit must be laid to rest. As Nancy approaches, the nun disappears. We don't know where she goes. And Neil doesn't seem too concerned. She's like, oh, she's gone. We're we're out in the middle of the cemetery. Like She couldn't have just vanished. So we're back in group. Straight talk only in this room. They say this so many times. They say this a dozen times. Straight talk only in this room. Even later, when they meet to, to kind of have to create a shared dream and to go fight Freddy, Nancy's like, Straight talk only in this room. It's like no, no, no. We we moved past all the, all the rules. So we're, we're we've we're doing battle here. These are dream warriors. None none of, no group talk <laughs> rules. Nancy gives Neil the, the skinny. Gives him uh, the backstory about Freddie and her experience. And so when they meet at group, Nancy tells the kids, "I know who's trying to kill you. You are the last of the Elm Street children." And so for those of you unfamiliar with the franchise. Freddy Krueger was a child murderer, not, I mean, it's implied he was a child molester, but that, that they never touched that in the series they do in right. the, in right. the remake, but that he was arrested and he got off on a technicality and the parents of the, the children that were murdered and the others in the community conspired and decided to take on, on vigilante justice. And <laughs> they, they trap him in, in the spoiler room and, they burn him alive. Right. And so he comes back to take revenge on the Elm Street children, the children of the people who murdered him, rather. So Nancy tells Kristen that she is the key because she has this ability to bring other people into her dreams. And she can kind of create like a Google Hangout in the dream world, <laughs> bringing everybody together. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it's, it was on my mind because this is what we use to uh, to record now. <laughs> and it says, hey, we all have these dream powers. And Neil's like, you sound like Peter Pan. Which, which the scene is kind of like that. It's it like is. Everybody's kind of discovering what their uh, their powers are. And so that they undergo hyp- group hypnosis. Neil goes along with it, but is doubtful. But Joey gets away. He's following his little nurse friend. And she's like doing the thing, you know, the, the wagging finger, like be- beckons him into the room. And she she talks a lot during the scene. It's like, I just wanted to get you alone for a second. I've always been really attracted to you and and I really shouldn't be doing this and all that crap. So sits him down on the bed and he's got this look on his face like I, he's gonna get laid. <laughs> <laughs> so meanwhile the group is asleep and then something happens and they realize that they're in the dream world. Like that I can't remember what it's called, but you know that little thing you see on people's desks that's got the the balls with the uh that are on strings and you uh-huh. it's 
Yes, I go and, back and as forth. A, as a matter of fact, I used to have one. I did too, but it, the strings would always get tangled up. And tangled up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's yeah, a name for that. This was definitely a lot like it. Uh, oh, a pen, a pendulum. I'm googling this, and I my first the first words I typed were balls swinging. <laughs> 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 I, yeah, it is a pendulum it is a pendulum okay it is a pendulum aha i have good memory neil doesn't believe that they're that they're all dreaming and, and will says well look at this and he just stands up his legs are strong in his dreams and he can walk he is the wizard master <laughs> and he's so confident about it too i, lo- I, lo- I love his his passion and, and zeal kristen is apparently a gymnast <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's cartwheeling and flipping all over the place. <laughs> I, w- I would have been fine if she was just like the person that kind of connects everybody in the dream yeah, world. But she had to but be a gymnast. Got to be a gymnast. Oh my god! It's a Peter Pan moment, indeed. You Can know what I think? I think what happened is like she was like when the directors were uh, doing their thing, and they they probably asked her, "So what can you do?" <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You know, oh, I, I used to do backflips. Yeah, I was like, okay, so you can do. You've got a gymnast background, so you can do whatever it is you're capable of doing on screen. And then for the more fancy stuff, we'll we'll bring in a stunt person to really to do like 400 flips or something like that. Right. <laughs> like I always, uh, this is I'm I'm not gonna get off here, but for a second, but it makes me think of this scene in Batman Returns when it's the Catwoman's first outing oh in costume gosh. and and saves this woman from from being uh, attacked and the woman's like oh thanks and michelle pfeiffer uh catwoman grabs her and says, oh you just waiting for some batman to save you i'm catwoman hear me roar and then she backflips out of the scene and she does like 20 backflips oh oh it's insane yeah and and it's impressive but I'm like that's not michelle pfeiffer <laughs> doing that <laughs> oh and, yeah that's insane yeah anyway uh, back to <laughs> dream warriors yeah. <laughs> so Kincaid has super strength. He can bend bars. Uh, he bends the, the legs of this metal chair. And Taryn, she's got this massive punk rocker mohawk. <laughs> and it's a great line. In my dreams, I'm beautiful and bad. <laughs> got her two switch blades. This is sexy badass. Yeah. And so meanwhile, Joey and the nurse, they're uh, she is undressing for him. We. <laughs> If about we, to get it on. Yeah, yeah. If if this if we had done the drive-in totals, this would have been <laughs> been our our two naked breasts. <laughs> She's like, "Do you like my body, Joey?" And he's like, nodding real fast. Oh, like yeah. he's, he's so anxious. So they start kissing, but then, oh, something's wrong. She's pulling away from him and she's got this massive tongue. And she, as she stands up, she barks. <laughs> she barks these like mini tongues, <laughs> tongue worms. I don't know what you tongue, want to call yeah, them. Like, yeah, like tongue worms. Um, yeah. As restraints. So his wrists and ankles, so he's uh, restrained to the bed. And the nurse turns into Freddy. And there, he's got a one liner, of course. What's the matter, Joey? Getting tongue tied in the bed, <laughs> like the mattress falls away, and he he's hanging over this uh, fiery precipice. Now, for this uh, like sexy nurse scene, the set was flipped, so Rodney Eastman, who plays Joey, was standing up. So, like the bed is kind of mounted to the wall. Oh wow! And so he's standing up uh, while he appears to be strapped to the bed, and he had to be spread eagle for so long that he that he passed out. He said it was the experience was very much like an like a crucifixion. Oh my gosh! Yeah, because holy like his, crap! His, his hands were held above his head for so long. Why do you think they put it as if he was standing up rather than just laying down? I think it was just for convenience of shooting it, so that like the you know you've got this bulky camera. I mean, yeah, you could suspend it over the bed but i don't know right. maybe they just felt like it was more practical in the moment i'm not really sure oh, okay it's a good question because it's really just yeah. him behind a, like a green screen right or a blue screen whatever they used but the group can't get out of the room there's noise there's light and the room starts to change and fire bursts out of the walls the walls start closing in sims bursts into the room and sees that everybody's asleep so this turbulent uh closing in of the walls a la star wars is uh (laughs) is happening in the dream world of course uh joe they find joey and he is he's in a a coma i mean freddie's got him so he he can't he can't get back to to consciousness right sim says this session was unauthorized and this head guy i don't know who the hell he is maybe he runs a hospital but he comes and says nancy you don't know shit and so you're out of here you and dr gordon you relieve get out of here and she shouts to, to, to Sims to listen to those damn kids. So what to do now? Like they're, they're totally helpless. 
And Sims looks confused when she's told that, like to listen to the yeah. kids. She, she thinks I th- in her mind, like she is a, a good doctor and she, and has good intentions, but she's not, she's not listening to them. She doesn't believe them because she's like we said earlier, she's coming from that standpoint is I'm the professional and you are children. And everything she says goes basically. Yeah. So Neil starts packing up. He sees the nun in the tower, goes after her, and he has to break into the t- into the tower to get in. He finds her, and she's telling him that this is where it all began. Purgatory, fashioned by the hands of men. The worst of the criminally insane were locked up here. And Neil says, well, this place was shut down in the 40s. And the nun says that there was a girl on staff that was accidentally locked in over the holidays and was raped hundreds of times. And then when they found her, she was with a child. Her name was Amanda Kruger. And her child was Freddy, the bastard son of a hundred maniacs. So Freddy, he was murdered, but no body was found. Find his remains and bury him in hollowed ground. And she, she goes, she vanishes. So in this movie, like we're getting the, we're getting this element of Catholicism and that, right. and that, that Freddy can be defeated with the help of, uh, you know, a higher power or with the, within the, uh, how do I put it? Uh, the, the the rules that have been established in in Christian lore of of, of getting rid of getting rid of your your of sins. demons yeah or, you know like that like basically like uh, Freddy's in a demonic nature mm-hmm. and he needs to be cleansed of his sins right so as Nancy's watching over Joey uh, she tells him speaking to Freddy let go of him you bastard and then Joey has his shirt open and then he slashes appear on his chest. It, writing and it says come and get in bitch it's a great <laughs> little taunt i love i love the the uh you know the back and forth that they have like they're, they're like robert england would say that it's this kind of beauty and the beast sort of thing and and uh i'm it's like a dance a dance with 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 nancy and freddie and it, i just love how he talks That's about awesome it. yeah I, I love how he talks about this these movies like he's he's very articulate he's very learned he's very almost scholarly in the, in his analysis and criticism. Right. And I love listening to him talk. I, I went earlier when we were talking about Rachel Talley, who, who was part of the whole series and had directed Freddie's dead. He, he tells the same story about her in every interview. He, he talks about, I go back to Roger Corman days with Rachel. And he always <laughs> says that in, in every interview. It's really funny. But anyway, apparently he, he's, he's a talker. Like uh, some of the makeup, Effects people say that they've heard every Robert England story there is. And there was a uh, like a behind the scenes thing where he, there's two Freddies talking to each other. There's Robert England talking to one of the stuck Freddies. And he's he's going on this random. I saw Barbara Streisand when she was playing in, in small theaters and and just <laughs> just talk, got all these <laughs> stories. But uh, anyway, anyway, Nancy and Neil get in the car and Neil's like, we need to know who killed him and who was responsible for burying his remains. And she says, I know somebody we can go talk to. So meanwhile, Kristen fights off Sims and Max and that creepy male nurse. And she's screaming, you're killing us. You're killing us. Nancy and Neil go to this bar and they find her father, former police Lieutenant Thompson. He's been demoted to security guard. He's played by John Saxon, returning from the first movie. He's drunk and she's gone. Oh, he's on oh, Nancy. It's been a while. Sit down. Completely ignores Neil. Doesn't yeah. even. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't even re- acknowledge that he's there, and which we which we see in a later scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. It, it, I, I like the dynamic dynamic those two characters have. Nancy says that Kruger's back, and he's like, "Oh, Nancy, you know that, that that's just not possible." Which he never believed her in the first movie after all that stuff happened. And uh, Neil makes some comment, and Thompson gets raw with him, and she says, "We need to know where the bones are hidden. P- please, you owe me." Right. And he does like after all the hell that he and his wife put their daughter through like, oh, in the first movie, sure. even to the point of imprisoning her. And then uh, in the first movie, she calls him while he's investigating Glenn's murder, uh, Johnny mm-hmm. Depp's character's murder across the street and says, I'm going to go get him, daddy. I'm going to get Freddie in 20 minutes or whatever. You be here to arrest him. And he's like, yeah, sure, baby, whatever, whatever. And he, he doesn't do he it. He doesn't do it. Yeah, and and meanwhile she's stuck in a house with Freddie, br- having brought him out of her dream, and she's there's bars on the windows, and the doors are locked because her mom is an alcoholic, and and <laughs> there's a great scene where she's trying to escape the house, and the mom's like sitting on the couch, and she's like locked, locked, locked. <laughs> De- so delirious. Yeah, very delirious. <laughs> like, she but she gets hers too. Jeez. Uh, so anyway, back to the Dream Warriors. <laughs> 
she says, you owe me. And he just kind of gives up. He says, nice seeing you. Like he won't help. Yeah. What a loser. And they leave and Nancy's visibly upset. And this really kind of got to me this time around, like her reaction, because she's been carrying all this baggage all this time for all this time. And here, like she's, it's not just her life that's at stake. It's the, the lives of, of these young children. And there's a lot riding on this and that her dad, if he would just tell them where the bones are hidden, then yeah. they can, they can just take care of it. But he, exactly. he He's, still won't own up to it because he was, he was in on Freddie's murder. So Gordon gets a beep, goes to the payphone, and it's, uh, it gets Taryn on the phone and says, Sims put Kristen in a quiet room and has sedated her. So Nancy's like, hey, we don't have much time. Nancy's like, I'm going to go back to the hospital. And Neil goes back to her dad. And he gets kind mm-hmm. of raw with him, gets kind of rough. Hey, I'm uh, and, I'm Neil. Nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he like shoves, shoves him up. up yeah. Against the, the wall. wall. <laughs> it's like, you and I are going on a little scavenger hunt. So we see Kristen. She's pacing to stay awake. Neil goes to a church for holy water with uh, Thompson. He takes a crucifix and some holy water. He puts it in like a whiskey bottle. And this priest catches him. He's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and Gordon gives him his driver's license as collateral. He's like, I really need yeah. this. Here's my driver's <laughs> license. <laughs> no one really cracked me up. Nancy arrives at the hospital. Max is there. Good old Larry Fishburne. He won't let her in. Nancy tells him, she's like, Kristen is in danger. Let me see her. And Max is not on her side anymore. And like, even if she hadn't have gotten uh, fired and from, uh, restricted from entering the hospital, that he, he wouldn't let her let her in anyway. So she's like, okay, well, at least let me say goodbye to the others. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he caves. Neil and Thompson uh, arrive at an auto salvage yard. Uh, Thompson says it's deep in the heart of the place. Take it slow. I love John Saxon. This he's so like he's so cool. I don't know. He's yeah, he's very he's subtle in this movie. Which I mean, he's kind of a subtle actor anyway. But I, I when, really like him in this. When he starts to get serious about the, the the situation, I mean, he starts acting very, I guess, professional about everything than yeah. what he was as a drunkard. Yeah, he starts sobering up fast because I think he's he's getting really uncomfortable. Like I don't think he completely buys it yet that Freddie's back, but right. he's unnerved by the whole thing. So yeah, take it slow. Nancy gets in uh, the room with where they have the group therapy and the uh, the kids are in there. And this, yeah, she says straight talk only in here. I don't know. Uh, this, no, this, this, why? <laughs> this is serious stuff. Let's get, get, get going. Yeah. So, okay, we're going to go in. We're going to go into the dream world together. It's risky, but who's in? Everybody agrees. Nancy starts the thing, the little pendulum for hypnosis. And suddenly we see Kristen and she's back in her room. It's the scene from the beginning where she's building the house. Her mom comes in. Why are you still awake? They hug and put her to, <laughs> to bed. She says, Mom, I had the worst dream. And we hear like the date from downstairs. Where do you keep the bourbon? <laughs> and, <laughs> and then the mom is, is she's standing in the doorway and, and pulled out of sight. And then Freddie is there in a tux. <laughs> It's, I said, where's the fucking bourbon? <laughs> <laughs> and he behead, I mean, it's, I love this scene, but he oh, beheads her great. and is holding the head up uh, to Kristen. He's like, listen to your mother. And the head starts talking. <laughs> and Kristen jumps through the window to escape. She tumbles down the, the staircase in the Elm Street house. She's calling for Nancy. And there's a neat little transition here. Like each dream warrior kind of gets their own little, little battle here with Freddie. Mm-hmm. And the transition yeah. is this kind of, uh, like these feathers falling in front of the uh, the camera. So we see Taryn. She's in her, her punk rocker getup. She wanders into this alley and she sees like this uh, graffiti. It says Taryn and Freddy. She's got her switch blades out. Music's pretty cool here. Freddy shows up, says, welcome home. And they have this little melee fight and she gets some good hits in. He says, why should we fight? You're, we're old friends, you and I. Let's get high. And he pulls his hands up and he's, each finger has a syringe on it. Right. And the little track marks on her arms, their little mouths, they're, they're just kind of opening and closing. And he injects her with all these drugs and what a rush. <laughs> you could just, you could, I like the effects in this scene because you can literally see it going up her face. Right. You can see like the veins in her, in her head bulge from her face and neck. It was very well done. Yeah. I really, I really like this bit. I think originally they were going to have an exploding head gag, but it, they couldn't get it to work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> uh, so uh, Will is next. He's in this narrow, dark hallway, and he's chased by this demented wheelchair from hell that I also got to see at Planet Hollywood in Nashville. I got a picture yes. of that, too, somewhere. 
Is this the chair for you, kid? And the thing chases after Will again. And he says, I am the wizard master. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got this these powers and this cloak with a high collar. And he blows the chair up. He's got this force lightning thing. <laughs> and he's zapping Freddy. And Freddy just grabs him and says, I don't believe in fairy tales and stabs him right in the heart. This poor kid. I know. I mean, it was like he was uh, Doctor Strange for a little bit there. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh. So Kristen's still wandering around the Elm Street house. He finds Nancy. Kincaid breaks through the wall and he's taunting Freddy. And this metal door appears suspended uh, before them, just hanging in the air. And I love this because somebody says, it's a door. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah sure it's uh... very good <laughs> the door opens and they descend the spiral staircase meanwhile back at the savage yard thompson he points he says that's it the caddy so neil checks it out and Z- sax is doing some good work here in his face like he he's i don't know he doesn't know, know what to make of this but he he's he's revisiting this and reliving it and bring and i'm sure it's bringing back a lot of really bad memories mm-hmm. but it, it's just real, a really uncomfortable place to be Neil finds the bones in a bag in the trunk, but Thompson's going to try to leave. He tries to get the car, but Neil has the keys, and he tells Thompson, you're about to attend a funeral, one that's long overdue. And he oh, tosses man. Thompson the shovel. That's a great line. <laughs> and so Kristen, Nancy, and Kincaid, they're in this large boiler room. Joey is mm-hmm. suspended with his tongue restraints. Freddie appears, and this is you know the Dark Knight moment where he's uh, Nancy tells him uh, to let him go, and he says, "Your wish is my command." And the the tongues start to slip off, and he's about to fall into this this pit of fire. And Nancy grabs him in the nick of time. But, but yeah, this reminded me of the Dark Knight when Batman tells the Joker, to "Let her go." <laughs> Very poor choice of words. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, to. exactly. Oh my gosh, you're so right. <laughs> <sighs> the uh, Joker's lines. I, oh, I swear. So they pull Joey out. Uh, Nancy spears Freddy in the gut, and he just laughs and pulls it out, licks the blood off. And that's when he shows off his his uh, chest of souls. He rips the sweater open and says, oh, you know, the souls of my children. They give him strength, <laughs> and there's always room for more. But then he, he pauses. He senses something is wrong, and he disappears. Right. Take a little, little break. Letting a Kincaid go from yeah, his grasp, you know. Right, and right. I, I also, I also want to point out, uh, Kincaid is probably my favorite character. Oh in yeah, this movie. Um, it, in that scene before they switch into that boiler room, and he's like threatening, uh, Freddy. He's yeah. like, he's like, Yo, Freddy, where you hiding at, you burnt face pussy? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah <you> burnt <laughs> face pussy. He's, yeah. he's like, then it's like, you think you're hot shit with the little new kid, don't you? Well, let me see, come get a piece of meat, crooked pussy. No, he's a little chicken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's 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 great. He comes back for a brief moment in in part four. I, I like him best. Right. <laughs> back in the salvage yard, uh, Neil and Thompson get spooked. They hear something. The cars all start coming to life. And then there's panic. Bury the fucking thing. And from this bag, these bones reassemble and become this Ray Harryhausen skeleton and that starts attacking Neil. Yeah. Oh, man. And Thompson is convinced now it's it's really you. And they fight. And Thompson is imp- impaled on the a fender. And Neil is knocked out. The Freddy skeleton shovels dirt over him. And he does this little like celebration dance like where he's... Yeah. Throwing his fists in the air, the skeleton does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's and then he, the bones, the life comes out of the skeleton, and the bones just collapse to the earth. What did What did you feel about that scene? I don't know. I don't. I feel like it doesn't go on long enough. <laughs> it could have. Yeah, I mean, I like the claymation skeleton, but yeah, um, yeah. I felt like sure there were t- time and and resources that they they were limited in what they could do. So right. Right, right. So I'm fine with it, even in retrospect. It was a nice little celebration. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, I don't <laughs> that part. Raw, of, raw, re- I could have, I could have <laughs> done without that. Just have the skeleton like go lifeless. So back in the dream world, they're in this hall of mirrors. Freddy is taunting them, and, and there's multiples of him peeking in through these these mirrors, and he's trying to pull each one of them through a mirror, and they they are pretty much all taken or captured. But then Joey he screams, and all the mirrors shatter. And all of the Nancy and the Dream Warriors pop back out into this hallway. Nancy, I don't know. She's like, "Oh, it's he's gone. It's over." 
And I don't know why like she that felt that it was over. I, I don't, don't know. know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the, yeah. I mean, hey, at least we know Joey's superpower now, you know. Right. Right. So they make yeah, they make the point to say that that your voice is your your dream power and stuff. And then Thompson, the father of of Nancy, appears to her and she's Looks like, like he came down from heaven. Yeah, he exa- you know? yeah, exactly. Daddy? <laughs> And <laughs> says, I've crossed over, princess, and I'm very sorry about everything bad I've done to you and stuff. And so they hug. It's a sweet moment. But then Blade's in the gut and it's Freddy. And he's like, die. And it's, it's truly vile how he deceives her. Oh, yeah. Like she's a, a very pure character. And, and ultimately, she is Freddy's ultimate foe. Like She was his greatest threat. And so he had to... To take her out. Like she was she was the strong one. She was the one kind of leading the charge. So Nancy stabs Freddie with his own glove. She does get a last a last good knock in there before she dies. And meanwhile, Neil, he, he's coming too and he's crawling out and he manages to push the bones into the grave and sprinkle holy water on them you know, for Nancy. And Freddie light bursts out of him and Neil does the crucifix thing. He doesn't say it, but it's that the power of Christ compels you thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this uh, cross appears on Freddy's head and light and still still bursting out of him. And he starts spinning and then Freddy just vanishes. Now, I was talking to some, uh, some people online about this this ending. And I, and I, I mentioned that it was kind of a, a, a disappointing ending. But I think really I just I like the ending overall, but I don't like that Freddy just kind of disappears vanishes right right yeah. well and, and and the the point of this particular movie in the series has to do with him being a demonic person mm-hmm. in the world of christianity you know you, you can you can go about it as you want to um and I, I do agree with you. I think they could have done a better job with how they ended Freddy's appearance in this movie. I think they got the point across with the holy water and the crucifix, mm-hmm. you know, and then you yeah. had that nice yellow bright glow coming out on all these different sides of Freddy. Mm-hmm. But it's just the whole matter of him going into this little wave form of a ball and disappearing into thin air. That's just like, it's yeah, like, I mean, it's, maybe I was just like comparing it to the other movies. Like he, right, he, he go, right. it goes out with a lot more fanfare in, in four yeah. and five and even in two, I would say, but his demise in part one is a little underwhelming too. But I mean, but I think overall they're appropriate. I just, I guess as a viewer, I, I kind of wanted just a little bit more there. So Kristen's crying. She's cradling Nancy. Nancy's been, you know, very much a in her corner this whole this whole time. And so it, it's a great loss for her. And at Nancy's funeral, I think this is the third funeral we have in this movie. Neil <laughs> uh, Neil is is there. He sees a headstone and he has this epiphany. Oh, the nun was Freddie's mother. That was Amanda Kruger. Neil goes home. He's sleeping soundly in bed. And then the Elm Street house model is on the nightstand. And w- one of the and one of the windows, like a light comes on. And then we we cut to black and we get Dream Warriors by Dokken. <laughs> yes. Rock out with some, <laughs> da, 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 some da. air guitar and some head banging. Oh man. It's a it's a great it's a good ending. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> song to wrap things up. So final thoughts. Favorite kill? <laughs> Oh man, I could, I could, uh, I love the TV kill, but I just, I love the climax in movies and Nancy's death was probably my favorite just because mm-hmm. of how it happened. Not necessarily the kill, but how it happened, you yeah. know, cause you're just looking at her dad and you're like, wow, I mean, that's like really him, you know, mm-hmm. this is all peaceful. And then all of a sudden four blades just go right into her damn stomach. You know, it, yeah, it was just, it was very well done. And that's probably my favorite kill in the movie. How about you? Yeah, I, I think that overall, the one that I like the most is is Nancy's. But just because I, maybe uh, that I'm older, I have a more like, ma- mature opinion about that. Like, I, I guess I have different reasons for liking that. However, like the the primetime bitch that TV through the head scene was, I thought, very creative. And uh, I like kind of how creepy and strange but yet funny that scene is it's it's kind yeah. of a like a mixed bag of emotions uh in that scene but i don't know i don't know i mean i, I kind of like them all <laughs> i just yeah. like them all yeah. <laughs> I, I could teach a class on this on just these movies that, maybe one day i can do like a special topics course and, it's yeah. just this whole series has such good value 
like, and I don't even think good is a decent adjective to describe such a series, you know, and there's particular movies that give a hallmark to a series such as this, and you have to do a job so well to have a sequel transition perfectly into the next one, into ne- into the next one and next one, uh, perfectly designed. You mm-hmm. know, everything culminated around Nancy. Piggyback onto the first film, I think they did a beautiful job in designing how her life began, how it ended, and mm-hmm. how Freddie was a part of that. Yeah, I think I think they handle her art, her character art, really, really well. I don't, I don't, I don't know. It, it's just it feels right. Yes. I, I, I don't know any other way to say it. It just to me, it makes sense, and I have no qualms about uh, about how they d- develop that in like the the broader architecture of the series. Right. Yeah. That, I think "right" is definitely a very good word for that, for sure. And now, coming soon to video cassette. Next time, we're going to be hanging outside the Quick Stop with our first guest host, Monster Kid Ryan. We might go next door to RST Video or play some hockey on the roof. It's Clerks from 1994, written and directed by Kevin Smith. So stay tuned for next time. Also want to give some shout outs to uh, my fellow podcasters. One from Cinema Beast Podcast and Latinx POV Podcast. Uh, Shout out to you guys for doing an excellent job. Uh, I know for Latinx, uh, you guys talk a lot about, uh, in culture terms, uh, what it means to be a person today in the modern world and uh, for cinematic beast you guys are doing an excellent job just talking about horror films uh and staying tuned to pop culture so uh thank you that's all we got for today folks so remember to rate and review the show on itunes and if you have questions or suggestions or just want to tell us what you think of the show email us at vericonvideo at gmail.com or call us on the veracon video hotline at 312-620-5560 we're on facebook twitter and instagram at veracon video We hope you all enjoyed today's show, and we will see you again next time to chat about another exciting movie from the rental era. So long, everybody. Peace out, guys. Goodbye, Vietnam! That's right. I'm history. I'm out of here. I got the lucky ticket home, baby. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Jenny. Bye-bye, boy. Have fun storming the castle. Goodbye. Do take good care of yourself. What is this, your farewell speech? Going home. Have a good trip. Hasta la vista, baby. I have to go. Adieu, auf Wiedersehen, Gesundheit. See you.